Any last questions? Professor, I did have one question. For the um, date of the test, it's mm -hmm. gonna close on April 18th or open on April 18th? It will close on the 18th. Okay, um, thank you. It's, it's probably, I mean, I can open it. I can open it this week if you want. I mean, it's <laughs> it's pretty much done. I've already written it. Um, so it's up to you, but usually what I do is I just, I usually open it up uh, on Sunday and then give you until Saturday to take it. But if you want me to open it up sooner, I certainly can. Um, that's okay. <laughs> whatever, whatever works for you. But April 18th sounds good. <laughs> whatever works for you, because it's done. Whatever works for you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. But the 18th, the 18th is when it closes. Awesome, okay. All right, so one of the things that, that students and just regular people um, have a hard time distinguishing the difference between a producer and an audio engineer. I mean, it's easier to, it's easy to sort of make, uh, to confuse the two duties. Um, but this video, I think does a really good job of explaining the difference between a producer versus an audio engineer. So here is a short video. Hey, what's up? It's Wick for Wikimedia, and today we're talking about studio roles. So we're going to take a look at the differences between a producer and an audio engineer. The last 20 or 30 years, a lot has changed in the studio, and we're going to be taking a look at the traditional roles of a producer and an audio engineer. And then we're going to take a look at how this translates to the modern producer. A producer oversees the overall production process. He usually gets his projects from the record label. In many cases, the producer is also responsible for the budget of an album. This budget gets decided by or approved by the record label. But a producer can also be heavily involved in the creative side of things. He then looks at the songs that the band already has for the project and uh, he can decide if they need more music or more lyrics and he can even have a direct influence on the song. So the producer then can have influence on the song structure, on the key, on the tempo and sometimes even on the lyrics. So many producers have got a great musical background and knowledge. In many cases the producer is also responsible for planning the rehearsal sessions and the recording sessions. In many cases the producer can also decide in which studio he wants to work and how many days that the studio needs to be booked. A good producer is always present during the rehearsal sessions where he can still have some influence on the song or maybe lyrics or the way that something is sang. The producer is always present during the recording sessions in the studio. A good producer always has a great ear for songs, structure and mixes and sounds in general. He also knows how things should sound in his opinion and how to create that sound. The good producers know a lot about audio equipment and how to use it. He knows exactly which compressor he wants on which vocal to create a certain sound and in many cases the producer is able to perform the mix himself. So let's take a look at how the audio engineer comes into play here. An audio engineer usually works for a studio and he knows all the ins and outs of the studio, literally. An audio engineer knows which gear there is, which microphones, how many cables, how the patch bay works. He knows everything inside the studio. He can also be the one plugging in the microphones, doing the microphone checks and setting up the tape machine. In many cases, the audio engineer operates all the gear, the console, and he operates the record button. In some cases, he directly performs all the tasks for the producer. So then the producer asks him to, uh, can you lower the fader on channel 13? Insert the LA-2A on track 5. So he's really hands-on doing the task for the producer the way that the producer hears it. And even though there are still a lot of studios working like this, a lot has changed in the last 20 years. We've seen a huge growth in the home studios due to MIDI equipment and synthesizers, allowing people to actually produce and record music from their home studio. So a producer nowadays can actually be a one-man army, and he often can be the artist, the producer, the audio engineer, the designer, the promoter, and he can independently release his record so he doesn't even need a record label. He can work from his own home studio or small project studios, and he can even compete with the high quality of high-end production facilities. Nowadays we've got great audio interfaces with really good analog to digital conversion, 
And we've got high-end equipment available, which normally was only available to really big studios. I hope I could clarify the differences between an audio engineer and a producer a little bit for you guys today. If you got any questions, you can always post them down here, and you guys should be checking out. All right, and that's video does a really good job of explaining the difference. The one thing he doesn't talk about when it comes to being a producer, the producer, I don't know how many of you played sports, but really the producer is sort of the coach, right? He is, or she is sort of the boss uh, in the studio. And so this, you know, like any good coach or producer is sort of a psychologist, right? He knows how to talk to people. He knows who he can or she can yell at or needs to have like a, you know, very calm conversation with about whether or not that they're doing their job. So they're, they're great. Um, they know how to manage people very well. And so a producer, whether it's film, music, whatever, they have to know how to handle people and work well with people. And um, so lots of times the producer, you know, needs to know, understand and know how people to operate. Because so all of us are, are very different in the way we communicate with these individuals, you know, for some of us, you, we can, you can nail that person. They're like, okay. And another person, if you don't let them, well, it's not going to work out so well. So it just, just really depends, but the producer kind of has a good, a good gauge on who he or she can yell at and who she has to use a different tone with. Questions? No questions. Okay, so, so some, some advantages of the, of the bigger labels. Now, mind you that a lot of these advantages are slowly gone away as the video just explained to you. You know, essentially you can have one person be a one man crew and or one woman crew and just, you know, do everything by themselves modern technology does enable us to all produce our own music even you know at the same quality of a studio even within your own house if you have the equipment so anyways number one is a and r so artist and repertoire a and r a and r so a and r is sort of the creative branch of the label they have commercial expertise in terms of knowing and understanding, you know, how to make you essentially popular, they will or can support you with money. So let's just say that they, they do believe in you. Maybe they, they have listened to your demo and they think that you have talent. And so um, they will give you the money so for you to produce your own uh, single or produce your own album. So that comes from the a and r folks number two we have the creative folks the creative folks develop a person's an artist's identity and so you know are they going to develop that that artist to be like the girl next door is that person going to be um develop that sort of the rebel the bad boy or the bad girl um so they have to develop you know, essentially the identity of the artist. And in reality, right, if you think about the creative folks, they're the ones that help to, on some level, to position the artist. In other words, so they can, so this artists can stand out in the marketplace. They also collaborate on the artwork when it comes to the artwork on, on albums. And they also uh, collaborate on videos if the artist chooses to produce um, a music video, they work with the creative folks. And then we have the marketing and digital folks who are responsible for the, all the multimedia marketing campaigns, um, whether that's trying to make, help you make, develop a presence online or offline, offline meaning traditional. So that means, you know, whether it's through a billboards or maybe some sort of advertisement in a magazine, like in Rolling Stone. They're the ones that help to create these, mar these uh, multimedia marketing campaigns. So some call them integrated marketing campaigns. 
um, for the artist as the artist becomes quote unquote popular. Then we have the press and publicity folks. The press and the publicity folks handle um, all the media. And, and what I mean by that, they work with all the journalists from the various magazines. They work with all the journalists from newspapers. They work with the booking people for talk shows. And essentially they're trying to get you in front of the camera, right? Or at least get your name mentioned in the media. And so that's handled by all the press and publicity folks. So if you wanna get a, let's say an interview uh, with a talk show host, let's say it's Jimmy Kimball at, you know, late at night. Well, this, your, the press and publicity people have have a, probably a good a relationship or at least a relationship with the booking folks over at Jimmy Kimball and are able to book you in that, in that particular show. Number five, number five is SYNC. So SYNC, S-Y-N-C, SYNC. So think of it as short as, uh, it's um, an abbreviation of synchronization or synchronous. So SYNC, S-Y-N-C, and partnerships. So these are the folks that help to try to secure you, uh, you as maybe being a spokesperson for different sorts of brands, right? So they deal with all of the, um, the deals when it comes to you being a spokesperson. Maybe um, this singer is, I don't know, highly athletic. I don't know. I'll just say. And so these folks might reach out to, let's say, a Nike, because maybe this person's very athletic, very fit, and they think that you know him being a spokesperson for Nike might might be a good deal and might improve the artist's image and help Nike not only sell more shoes but also help this person sell more music because they happen to be a spokesperson for Nike. So again, they try to secure deals with like-minded brands that are gonna improve an artist's image. Uh, number six, global reach. So labels have the ability to bring artists' music to new territories. So again, they're able to bring an artist's, artist's music to new territories and grow their fan base. So again, bring artists' music to new territories and grow their fan base. So some of these big labels, like let's say a Sony or a Universal, because they have global reach that can reach all over the world, they can, they can make you popular in places like in, I don't know, Spain, or maybe in Japan, or maybe in Argentina, or in Mexico. So they're able to make your, make you, make you and your music popular all across the world. And global distribution. So these labels also are able to deliver, manage, and track your music. So again, deliver, manage, and track your distribution in terms of either, whether it's digital or physical. In other words, they were able to get your music, let's say it's, it's DVDs. They're able to get your DVDs into actual physical stores if, if needed. They also are the ones that make deals with streaming services. So let's just say that you wanna get your music played on Spotify or, or whatever. And so they make deals with these various streaming services. So that way you um, get paid for your music being streamed. What was sync and partnerships? Thank you, Pilar. So these are some of the jobs that are in the record industry, um, recording industry, I should say. Any questions on what these individuals do beyond some of that I already talked about. Um, the one position that people are, are kind of interested in or, or at least ask questions about, traditionally speaking, is the um, 
artist development. And so what I mean by artist development is maybe you are a great songwriter and maybe you're a great singer too. And so that part is well developed, but maybe you can't um, dance very well. And so the artist development part of um, the industry will find folks that will help you become a, a better dancer, right? So that's what I mean by an artist development. Maybe, maybe your singing is really good, but maybe your songwriting is not so good. And so the artist development folks will find people to train you to become a better songwriter. So that's what I mean by artist development. They'll, they'll take an artist and if the artist happens to have a weakness, they will help, they'll work on that particular weakness to make that um, artist better. And one thing that's not on here, that's also sort of an important gig or job is a manager. A manager, you know, oversees the contracts, oversees the career of the um, artist and making sure that the artist is, is not getting ripped off, which is, you know, you've heard, all heard uh, horror stories about artists not getting paid. It does happen a lot in the music industry. So managers are important because they understand the business end and, um, are able to um, get you paid what you deserve to be paid. So any questions on what these individuals do besides artist development? The others are sort of um, self-explanatory. Sales, sales and distribution have good relationships with, with uh, again, with streaming services and physical stores. So if you need to get your music on a streaming service, or if you need to get your music into stores, those are the folks that do that. Any questions on what these individuals do? Okay, so, and we're gonna go into more detail about this, especially the distribution stuff and production we've already talked about. And so um, bear in mind that um, all this, all these costs, production costs, marketing costs, distribution costs, they all go into um, the sunk costs before a, a the music drops. So in other words, for an artist to get paid, they have to recoup all these costs before the artist receives a cent, unless the artist receives an advance. So anyways, we've already discussed production costs. So if you're gonna hire a producer, like a, I don't know, like a Jay-Z or a Timbaland or Justin Timberlake, somebody like that, you know, a Snoop Dogg, anybody who you know has a name, and so let's say that you want them to be your producer. The producer fees, the more popular that producer happens to be, the more money it's going to cost, which goes into your part of your sunk costs. And whatever extra besides the production costs, because the producer is a gigantic fee, but then you have to find a suitable recording studio, whether it's in Austin, Los Angeles, New York, Nashville, wherever you're gonna record, you gotta rent that studio out. Whatever equipment that you need, you gotta rent that out as well. Um, sometimes it's included with the, with the rental, the studio rental, but not always. Um, they, they may have to hire musicians. If you're gonna have any background musicians, background singers, um, all of that goes into the cost of producing a master recording, right? The master recording essentially is after all these different tracks and after it's been sweetened and all that sort of stuff is done, you know, the producer along with the engineers are able to produce a master recording, right? The final copy. So that's part of your sunk costs. Then you have the marketing costs. How much does it cost to promote the master recording? So 
for you to produce any sort of ads, whether it's a television ad, radio spots, print ads, um, that goes into, into the cost of promotions. If you're, you're gonna have a, a publicity department, um, one of the big things that record labels used to do is that they would knock on doors of radio stations or at least send the radio station um, folks a copy of the single or a copy of the album. And the reason that they would do that is, is because they wanna secure spins for the artist. So a, a spin is every time you hear a song on the radio, it's called a spin. And so the marketing folks for labels um, would literally send CDs to all these different radio stations throughout the country, trying to convince the folks, the radio station, whoever's in charge of, of um, who's gonna be on the playlist to see if they would actually play that artist's music. So when I used to work, I used to work at a radio station too. My, I worked in different places, gosh. Anyways, I used to work at KJGI. I don't know if anybody's, anybody's ever heard of KJGI 99.1, long time ago. But anyways, we would get these, you know, boxes of, of uh, CDs of albums, but also singles, of all these different artists. And sometimes they would let me listen to the music and go, what do you think about this artist? Think we should play them? I'm like, like yes or no. And so um, all that is done to try to convince the radio stations to, to play that artist. Now, some artists already have names attached to them. So if they're Taylor Swift or somebody like that, you know, they already have like a gigantic name, a Billie Eilish, they're gonna, they already have gigantic names. So it's, easy, it's easier to get those names played on, on a radio than somebody that doesn't have, you know, that brand or that name. Uh, professor, can, yes, you, can you explain what a spin is again, really quickly, please? A spin is every time a song is played on the radio, it's called a spin. So every time a, a, a rec, a, when, your, rec, when your, your music is played by a radio station, it's called a spin. So it's the playing of your music on a radio station. Some, some artists are on high rotation, which means lots of spins. And then some are in moderate rotation, which means somewhat a lot of spins. And then some are in, you know, very few spins, which they rarely play. So only only one of you has heard of KGGI 99.1. It's out in um, it's out in Riverside. Yeah, I used to work, I used to work there. Yeah, it's radio, it's a radio station on. When I used to work there, it was on Iowa. It was on Iowa Avenue, Iowa Avenue in um, in Riverside. I'm not sure if it's still there. So this was years ago. So distribution costs. So now that we've okay, we have all these production costs, we have all the marketing costs, and then we have distribution costs. So just like in the movie industry or television, you have distribution fees. The distribution fees in, in music are, are different. They don't charge you as much. It's about 10 to, 10 to 15% is what the distributor will charge you. Um, it could be a little bit more, it could be 17, could be 18, could be 20, could be a little bit less, you know, it could be eight, could be seven. It's kind of all over the place, but ge generally speaking, the range is between 10 to 15 percent. So, it, so whatever money is collected by the distributor, they they keep 10 to 15 percent of that off the top. And so, distribution are the folks that you know that are making, but also shipping your CDs to the various stores. They're the ones that are negotiating deals with Spotify or Amazon or iTunes or they're also making deals or trying to get you um, spins as well. So they, they're, they're out there trying to get you lots of play. That's, what, that's a distributor's job. And so anyways, all these costs have to be recouped before the artist is paid. So this is why oftentimes you'll, 
hear about an artist that may have gone platinum. Platinum means that they sold a million copies of a single or a million albums. And they might say to you, well, or they, they might say, not to you, but they might say, I haven't received a cent yet. It's because the, um, the label must have spent a lot of time and money with production, marketing, and distribution costs that it's very possible that they haven't recouped their, their revenue yet or their costs yet, I should say. Yeah, I think it's, I, we used to play, um, we used to play top 40 music back in the day. And on Sundays, there was this guy named Art LeBeau. I'm not even sure if Art LeBeau is alive anymore, but he was this old like classic guy who used to play the oldies. His name was Art LeBeau. Um, and every Sunday, we would play a bunch of oldies. It's called the Art LeBeau Show. So yeah, it was fun. Working in radio was, was, was fun. Didn't pay a whole lot, but it was fun. All right, so who is the largest publisher? The largest publisher is Sony backslash ATV. So Sony backslash ATV. So A as in Adam, T as in Tiger, V as in vinyl. So Sony backslash ATV music is the largest publisher in the music industry right now. They made about $500 million, which sounds like a lot of money, but you know, in reality, it's, I mean, it's a lot, but it's kind of a small business within the music business. So the, the job of music publishing. So music publishing, I think I talked about this on with the lecture on Monday. The publishing division works with the songwriters. They discover good songwriters and they help to develop song, uh, good songwriters by teaching them how to buy, write better lyrics, those sorts of things. And essentially the publisher collects a royalty from the record label for each copy that's produced. So oftentimes the label also owns publishing. Yeah, Art LeBeau, I think he's still alive. That guy must be like 90. I mean, my God, or maybe even 100. But yeah, he's, he's cool. He's a cool dude. Um, so again, publishing collects a royalty from the record labels for each copy produced. And so they also pay the a composer songwriter. So that question mark, it should be composer and songwriter. So backslash composer songwriter, a royalty. Oftentimes it's a 50 50 split. With the publisher. So again, pays composer songwriter a royalty, often a 50 50 split with the publisher. So the publisher and the songwriter split the revenue 50-50. That's usually the standard deal between a songwriter and between a publisher. So one of the great things about um, being a songwriter is that essentially your career as a, as a songwriter can last forever, right? You're, and you're always paid, unlike a recording artist, who eventually your voice will, unless you're like Barbara Streisand or something like that. Generally speaking, your voice gets shot after a certain number of years. Um, a songwriter can keep writing forever until they, you know, until they die and keep getting royalties. If you're good, like let's say like a prince or something like that. Um, anyway, so the publishing division also finds a suitable singer for the sheet music or composition. And so let's just say that you are Prince. Okay, you were Prince, the great, the great singer and songwriter. And so let's say Prince writes a song and 
maybe he doesn't want to sing that song or maybe he doesn't think his voice is right for that song. Um, Prince will go out or the publishing division for whoever working with Prince will go out and find a, a good singer or a better singer for that song, that sheet music, that composition. Also publishing promotes music to ad agencies. This is why you see some songs in commercials. This is why you'll see songs in movies or television programs. Sometimes you'll see sometimes um, songs in video games is because the publishing division goes out and tries to convince these folks to play um, their music in commercials and music or in video games or et cetera, et cetera. Thank you, Maricela. Yes, pays composer 50 50, uh, pays the, um, a composer, songwriter, a royalty to 50 50 deal with the publisher. That is correct. That's the standard deal. So, this is the way it works, just kind of give you a flow chart of how it works, right? Oftentimes, the record label and publisher are together, but not always. And so, the record label receives the money, right? From, from uh, let's say a sale of a, of, a, of a CD or from a streaming service or whatever. They get the money, they pass that money on to the publisher. The publisher then pays the songwriter and whatever the publisher collects, generally speaking, it's a 50-50 split between the publisher and the songwriter. Questions, questions. So these are the publisher's main revenue streams. We have what's called synchronization royalties. So when I talk about synchronization, I'm referring again back to, maybe you guys, hopefully you watched my video, uh, the lecture from Monday when I talked about um, master, master recordings versus sync recordings. So anytime you're using an, an actual master recording of, of the song in a movie or a television program, the publisher is getting paid. If they're doing a cover of a particular song, like I think it was, I think I sent you the example of Pitch Perfect, I wanna say. And so they, were, they did a lot of covers of various songs. And so um, they're gonna get paid a synchronization royalty for using that music and um, placement affects how much you get paid. So if your music is played in the beginning of a movie, like the first scene, the first scene or when the, or the, when the credits are rolling in the beginning or at the very end, oftentimes that placement, uh, you can ask for more money as the publisher. Or if you get placed in a very important scene in a movie, you can ask for more money from the filmmakers. So again, generally speaking, it's a 50-50 split between the whoever the recording artist is or the songwriter, I should say, is the songwriter and the publisher. And they split that those fees 50-50. This is about 26% of a royal of a publisher's revenue stream. So synchronization royalties again are about 26% of a publisher's uh, overall revenue. Mechanical royalties. So um, anytime a label makes a physical copy or even a digital copy of your music, the publisher is going to get paid. And as you can see here, for every song under five minutes, the publisher gets paid 9.1 cents. And if it's over and it's over five uh, minutes, it's, it's 1.75 per minute. So uh, multiply um, 1.75 cents uh, times five minutes, times five to kind of get a sense of how much that is. It's a, I think it's about 10 cents or something, a little, a little over, well, almost 10 cents, not 10 cents completely. 
But anyways, it's the artist and the publisher also split these mechanical license royalties 50-50. Now the label may not wanna pay 9.1 cents for every copy produced um, by the label. So they may wanna negotiate a lower rate. That's up to the artist whether or not they want to negotiate a lower rate. In mechanical license royalties is about 22% of a publisher's revenue stream, 22%. And if you're wondering how, how does an artist know how many copies are, have been produced but also sold, it's done through the Nielsen sound scans. So Nielsen sound scan essentially can track the number of sales. And that is a collect, and all these revenue is collected by the Harry Fox agency. So Harry Fox collects it, they pay the publisher and the publisher pays your artists. Performance royalties. So performance royalties are, are blank or performance licenses and performance royalties refers to um, music that's performed on radio or performed on a streaming service or royalties performed at, um, well, or from um, music played in venues, whether it's, it's a live music venue, whether it's a big baseball stadium, these are performance royalties. So it's either blanket or performance, uh, per public performance uh, licenses. So the publisher collects about 25% of this. And this is the main revenue stream for publishers. So again, performance royalties is the largest revenue stream for a publisher. It's about 43%, um, 44% more or less of a publisher's royalties comes from the blanket and public performance licenses. So if somebody covers your music in a live performance, it goes under performance royalties. If, if somebody, if the, Do the Dodgers play your music at Dodger Stadium, that's performance royalty. If a radio station, KISS FM or K-Rock, play your music on the radio, it's a performance royalty. If it's, I believe it's if it's streamed, it's a performance royalty. And so again, it's, it's a split between the publisher and the artist. And in this case, I'm referring to the artist as the songwriter, composer. Now, some of the richer artists, so I would assume like, uh, gosh, Taylor Swift strikes me as a very smart woman. And so somebody like Taylor Swift, who's I think very business savvy or at least surrounds herself with smart folks, which I think is a good thing. Um, my sense is that she probably owns her masters. Um, so a lot of the rich artists buy back their masters. They get their, they own their masters. They want to, they want to control their music. And so um, what they'll do, so since they're, they are busy and they are popular, they don't have time to be tracking all these different royalties. And so they'll just hire, you know, a, a publisher and say, can you just keep track of my music so I get paid? And so they'll get, usually give those folks or a publisher a, a, a 10 to 20 percent fee for administrating their their um, their music, but they don't actually own the music. Which, by the way, if you're, I don't know who, who here is a songwriter or composer or performing artist or whatever. Um, you generally want to keep your masters. I mean, it's hard to do in the beginning because obviously most people in the beginning are poor, but if you do have enough money to buy back your masters, you you, you want to do that, generally speaking. Uh, professor? Yes. You, uh, I'm so sorry. Could you repeat what the largest revenue stream is for a publisher and what the split is between? Performance, performance royalty. Uh, okay, so largest... And the publisher collects 25% of performance royalties. So, sorry, can you say that again? So for the last two bullets. The last largest revenue stream, it's a performance royalty. Okay. 
And it's a split between composer, songwriter, and the publisher. So Marcella and Shelby, you wanna, if possible, almost impossible in the beginning, but if possible, you want to control your masters. You wanna own your masters. Your master copies. And it was a split between producer, songwriter, and publisher? No, songwriter and composer are the same thing, mm -hmm. and publisher. So it's, it's between songwriter and publisher? Right. Okay. Thank you. Well, nowadays you can do that, Marcel. You can stay independent. It's, it's, it's nothing wrong with that. The only, the only issue with being an independent, it's hard it's hard wearing that many hats. You know what I mean? Like you also need to promote your stuff. You gotta administrate your stuff and it's, that can be hard. Yes, it is. It's hard on Spotify too. You're right. Okay, so typical distribution deal. So mind you that there's all sorts of distribution deals that take place in the music industry. Um, but really the, I'll give you three of them, but really the, the main one is a production deal is really the main um, distribution deal. Again, that's a production deal. That's really the main one. Um, and what I mean by this is usually the label will sign an artist, right? whether it's Marce Maricela, Marcella or Shelby in this case, let's just say a label signs you, let's just say you don't have a record, maybe you've, you've had an, enough money to produce a demo, but that's it. And so but you don't have a record per se, at least a polished you know, uh, record done in a studio or by you know, a well-known or highly trained producer to really sweeten it, to make it sound really good. And so um, in this case, right, the, the label is gonna say, okay, well, we'll pay um, for you to go out and, and make a master recording. And so they'll pay, the, uh, they'll pay the producer master, they'll promote the masters, they'll distribute the ma a master copy. Well, they'll make copies of the master copy and distribute it. And and then of course, um, they're gonna recoup their costs and then, then pay, pay the artist a royalty. So they're gonna sink all this money, right? And then after they recoup all their money, then they'll pay you a royalty if any is there to be made. So that's the, that's the main deal. That's the most, that's the typical distribution deal as a production deal. Again, new artist, no money. And they'll, the, artist, the label will essentially just produce a master copy for you. That's why I try to focus on YouTube. Oh, that's interesting. 20%, uh, what do you mean, uh, Shelby? Are you referring to YouTube's fee? Do they charge you a 20% fee? Professor Shelby and I were trying to figure out um, what was it? The performance royalties. Um, I just got confused because in the beginning I thought you said um, forty to like forty three percent or something like that. Um, well, that so was the main the main revenue stream for a publisher was a performance royalty. Correct, and that's that was forty to forty three percent or like something around there because later you said twenty forty three to forty four percent. Okay. Just because later you said 20%, so we got confused. No, the administration deal is 20%. Oh, okay. It's a 20% fee, more or less. Okay, so that was 10 to 20%. Okay, awesome, thank you. Uh-huh. So the other, the other distribution deals, which, which are, is sort of, kind of still sort of happen, 
they used to happen a lot uh, more before the digital age. And so there's something called a distribution deal. So the distribution deal means that the artist will deliver a certain number of copies of, of the music. In other words, the artist like Marcella or maybe Shelby, maybe you guys know how to produce music. And so you've, you've made a master, you've made copies. And so now you just need, need a distribution company, a label to sell the music for you. All you need is a distributor. So you produce everything already. You just need a distributor. And so you're just gonna use the distributor for its network and that's all. And so it's, this is a rare deal nowadays because obviously the idea of selling vinyl, even though vinyl sales are going up and the idea of selling traditional CDs in, in stores, um, that's sort of going away as well. So the idea of needing a distributor to, to ship out physical copies, it's, it's becoming sort of um, obsolete. It still happens a little bit, but not really. The last deal that happens a little bit, but not, also not really, is a press and distribution deal. It's called also a P&D. Anybody's ever heard of a P&D? Yes, number one, the main deal is a production deal. Has anybody ever heard of a P&D? No. Okay. Um, so P and D stands for press and distribute. So for press and distribute, again, let's say it's Marcella or let's say it's Shelby again. And so in this case, again, Marcella or Shelby were able to produce, they deliver a master, a master copy. They did it all by themselves. And they also did all the artwork. So the artwork on the album, right, or on the CD, they did all that by themselves. And all the record label is going to do is make copies of the master and they're going to promote the master with the artwork. And um, if, the, um, if they make a profit off the sales, they'll give the artist a royalty. So again, it's called the PND, where the artist delivers a master copy plus the artwork, and the label is going to reproduce the artwork, make copies of it. They're going to make copies of the master. They're they're going to market it and promote it, try to get spins and all that sort of stuff. And if they make a profit, they will pay the artist a royalty. Now they don't. They don't really do p and deals as well, unless the artist has a huge or a significant um, social media presence. So if they have a, a pretty significant social media presence, then they'll do a p and deal, um, but otherwise not really. So I know Marcella talked about YouTube. I'm not really quite sure. I'm guessing, I'm guessing she, she uploads her music onto YouTube. That's my guess. And so let's just say that Marcella has a huge following on YouTube. And so, um, and so because she has this huge following then she can essentially negotiate a deal with the label where she has her master copy and she does artwork that's gonna be on the album cover, right? Or on the CD cover and then negotiates a deal with the distributors. But again, this is only going to happen if Marcella happens to have a huge social media presence or at least a significant presence on, on social media where they can be able to monetize this. So those are the, the last two I, just, I, I described, distribution deal and the P&D deal are 
are sort of rare just because the industry is, is changing so quickly. So the, the important thing to remember again is the production deal is the main, the main deal nowadays. And again, generally speaking, the fee, distribution fee is generally about 10 to 15%. All right, some PROs, which stands for Performance Rights Organizations. So PRO stands for Performance Rights Organizations, as well as Harry Fox. And so ASCAP, it started in 1914. It's the, it's the oldest of the PROs, the performance rights organizations. And so ASCAP, well, as an artist, again, Marcella or, or Shelby um, will have a choice, right? Do they wanna be represented by ASCAP or do they wanna be represented by BMI? So they have to, there's differences. And I'm not really, not too sure what the big differences are, but from what I've heard from people who work in the industry, they, they do say that there are differences between ASCAP and BMI. Um, and those are the two main performance rights organizations that are gonna collect royalties on your behalf. So you need to pick one or the other. I don't believe you can pick both. I think you have to be one or the other. Anyway, so ASCAP started first. And so again, they, they monitor all the performance rights. So whether if somebody covers your music, you get ASCAP gets notified and they collect that revenue and they pass it on to you. If um, music is played on the radio, they get notified and they send the money to you. Now, if you're wondering how, do they, how would they know if your music is being, being played on a specific radio station? Well, when I used to work in the radio station, one of my jobs was um, printing out the playlists. So in other words, the disc jockey would get a list of the music that they're supposed to play on an hourly basis. And so the radio station is supposed to send a copy of the playlists to ASCAP and to BMI. So ASCAP and BMI can review the files and go, okay, this Taylor Swift was played 20 times. Billie Eilish was played 50 times. So this is how they monitor and track um, how often a song is played on a radio station. And so ASCAP and BMI will then collect the fees and then pay the members. This is where they pay the publisher as well as the, um, the artists like the, song, like the singer. They pay them a royalty and it was founded by uh, Victor Hubert. Victor Hubert founded ASCAP. And I believe Victor Hubert was an artist. So Hubert spelled H-E-R-B-E-R-T. So CSAC, has anybody ever heard of CSAC? Started in 1930. Only one person. That's good. So what is CSAC, Marcella? Can you explain? No. I think Marcella's on mute. Anyway, so CSAC does the exact same thing that BMI and ASCAP do, except they represent um, European artists. So CSAC represents primarily uh, European artists. So they do this, they monitor live performances, they collect licensing fees, and they pay the members a royalty. And so CSAC, but again, CSAC primarily represents European artists. They're located here in the United States, obviously, because some European artists do get play here in the United States. I think they have offices in 
I want to say LA, New York, Austin, I would imagine, and probably Nashville. Um, BMI. So BMI is the competitor to ASCAP here in the United States. Started in 1939, primarily by, it was started by um, uh, label executives or executives. The reason they didn't like ASCAP was because ASCAP had a, had a, had a monopoly on this part of the business. And so BMI was created to um, provide competition to ASCAP. And so they do the exact same thing that ASCAP does, um, except they were started a little bit later. There are some differences, which I'm not 100% sure, but artists swear there are differences between BMI and ASCAP. Uh, number four is sound exchange. So sound exchange collects digital performance royalties. So sound exchange collects digital performance royalties. So things, for instance, on Spotify is collected by sound exchange. Yeah, some people, yeah, some artists go back and forth with ASCAP and BMI. I'm not, again, I'm not sure which one's better. I've heard, and again, I don't, I don't know, I'm not an artist, but at least not a musical artist, but I've heard that um, depending on the type of, type of genre that you have, um, ASCAP does a little bit better of a job promoting specific types of genres where ASCAP does, BMI does a better job of promoting other types of genres. And again, I don't know if that's really the case. Um, and again, Harry Fox is, is a mechanical license rights. They collect all the mechanical license fees. So every time there's a copy made of a song, uh, whether a digital or a um, physical copy of a song on a CD or on a vinyl, uh, the artist gets paid for every copy produced. And that money is collected by Harry Fox, who then pays again, the publisher. Hmm, interesting. I've heard that, yeah, uh, yeah. I'm not sure which is better for songwriters. I've, I've heard that too, but I, I've heard different things from different people, so I can't, with the voice of authority, say which one is better. But I've heard that. You're right, Marcella. So um, the Recording Industry Association of America, or RIAA, was created in 1952. What time is it? Oh, I have time still. Good. So um, they protect intellectual property. So meaning that um, they try to protect the songs written by artists, that the songs that were sung by recording artists and try to prevent uh, the unauthorized distribution, whether it's on, on, on Napster or something like that. They try to prevent piracy from occurring um, as much as possible. I'm trying to protect the, uh, the copyrights of the artists. They also try to protect the First Amendment rights of artists, this idea of the government censoring artists. Um, they try to protect artists. It, sometimes RIAA will have um, some discussions with retail stores and say it's a Walmart or a Target, because sometimes, or I should say often, these retail stores will not play music with cursing. Not that that's the first, they're not, they can do that because they're a private business, but the RIAA tries to does, does try to protect the First Amendment rights of the artists, as well as trying to get uh, retail stores to play music even if it has profanity on it. Ah. Okay, I didn't know that. I didn't know about the songwriter part. That's, thank you, Marcella. Research. So also the RIAA does research on behalf 
of um, the artists and the industry trying to figure out what are the trends in the industry, right? So for instance, obviously right now the trend is streaming and the RIAA I'm sure knew long before that streaming was going to become big at some point in time. And so the RIAA tries to do research in terms of trends and trying to figure out where is the industry moving towards? Where is it going? So right now, one of the big things that's going on, and I'll talk about this later, is um, NFDs. Has anybody ever heard of NF? No, NFTs, I should say, NFTs. Has anybody ever heard of NFTs? Non-refundable tokens. Yeah, so right now that right now in the industry, that's kind of like a big deal. And so, but I'm sure again, at some point in time before this became a big deal, the recording art and the, the RIAA, I'm sure, did some research and probably notified um, the artists that this was going to be a trend moving forward. And again, we'll talk about NFTs um, later, but NFTs is becoming a big deal in the industry. Um, millions of dollars are being made off of NFTs. Um, awards sales certificates, including digital sales. So um, 500,000 copies, of, of selling an album or a single is considered a gold record. Platinum is a million copies sold of a single or an album. And Diamond, Diamond is 10 million copies of a single or an album sold. So again, gold is 500,000, platinum is 1 million and diamond is 10 million. And the RIAA has spent a lot of money on lobbying the government for all sorts of things, trying to advocate on behalf of the um, music industry, trying to get them to rule in certain ways. Again, going back to the idea of, of protecting the First Amendment rights of, of artists to not be censored by, by government. And DEMA, DEMA is, although it's losing, it's losing of importance, used to be a really big deal when, when uh, people were doing iTunes. Uh, people were not doing iTunes as much as they used to be. And so DEMA used to be an important revenue stream for those sorts of companies. So artist royalties. Um, so the way there's all different types of royalties. This is probably why Marcella says I'd rather be an independent and not deal with the label. I'd say you're a smart woman. Um, so you get a paid a royalty based of, of a percentage of wholesale price. So you might be able to negotiate a, a percentage of the retail price. So obviously a percentage of the retail price would be a lot better than a percentage of the wholesale price because retail price is oftentimes elevated by 50%. And so obviously you wanna make a percentage off of like a $17 retail sale versus a $8 wholesale uh, sale. So, but it can vary between again, a percentage of the wholesale price, let's say it's $10 or a percentage of the retail price, which would be then $20. Generally speaking for new artists, and again, this 11 to 14% is, is kind of like the norm. But of course, if you can negotiate, certainly an artist, a new artist can certainly negotiate more than 14%, just really depends on who the artist happens to be. You also can get paid in bumps and steps. And what I mean by that is it's based off of sales. So let's just say that for the first um, 100,000 copies sold, you're getting paid um, 11%. And then 
once for then for 100,000 copies to 200,000 copies sold, you're getting paid 14%. Then from 200,000 copies to 300,000 copies, you're getting paid 17%. So you guys see what I'm saying? So for, you're getting paid in bumps and steps. So in other words, you're getting bumped up a percentage based on the steps in terms of sales. The more sales you have, the more they bump you up in terms of a royalty. You could also get paid to what they call an advance payment. In other words, they can give you a lump sum of money before you record. The problem is that you don't, um, on the back end, you're not gonna get paid as much. Yeah, that is true. You get lost in the weeds. That's 100% accurate. As a new artist, it's always, it's always tough. You gotta, you gotta prove yourself. And oftentimes as a new artist, they don't know if you're a flash in the pan, right? Only good for one album or one single, or if you're gonna have a long steady career. So it just, just really depends. And so you're right. It's being a beginner in anything sucks, honestly. Um, other royalties, you can get a, royal, a percentage of your singles or, versus, or a percentage of your albums. Again, um, it can be negotiated. Generally, at least um, downloading, you get paid less of a royalty for downloads. So if somebody downloads your album or downloads your single, at least traditionally it was a, between a five and 8% royalty, which again sucks if it, for a, a digital download. Yeah, it's, you get put in the back. Yeah, all that is, it's all 100% accurate. So royalties are paid after recouping packaging, recording and promotional costs. And packaging literally means the glass casing of what they put a CD in. Um, also refers to the, the plastic packaging that goes onto a CD. So all that is part of what they call the packaging. And they all, and by the way, the, the label is charging you for all that. Um, if you're on your third or fourth album, let's just say that the fourth album is a gigantic hit, but because you've lost money in your previous records, they're gonna recoup all the previous losses in the previous records before they pay you for your current music. So let's just say that you had three uh, albums where you didn't make a profit, and then your fourth album goes diamond. Well, guess what? You're still not getting paid anything until the label recoups all its losses from the previous albums. So a 360 deal means an all encompassing deal. So that means they're taking money from obviously your recording, all the money that you make from touring. If you are a spokesperson for let's say um, a fact, company they get portion they get money for that if you have your own merchandising company they get a portion of that so any way possible that a late that a, a songwriter or singer i should say makes money all encompassing 360 the the label is getting a percentage of any way you make money it's called the 360 deal all encompassing 360 means that in every direction you look the label is getting the portion of your revenue And by the way, you don't have to sign 360 deals. You could also sign a, what they call a 270 deal. You can sign a 180 deal. 270 deal means that you can essentially sign a deal with a label where they only take three revenue streams. A 180 deal means that they, they only take money from two revenue streams. So it doesn't have to be a 360 deal. So the most powerful folks, own their masters and they also control their publishing rights. So the most powerful folks, again, own masters, their master recordings, and they also control their publishing, their publishing rights. And so um, musicians make their money through hourly fees, um, based off of whatever the union rate is. 
And of course, if they're really good musicians, background musicians, they can negotiate their own hourly fees that go above and beyond whatever the, the union rate is. So one last video, and I think I'm getting pretty close to the end, but just, I think Marcella and Shelby already sort of know this already about the music industry. But I do think that this is a really cool video talking about all the things that artists have to overcome to make money. I'll, I'll show it later, I guess. I'm gonna have that on here, darn it, darn. So anyway, I think it's three, I do believe it's 345, which is the end of lecture. Wait hurts, questions. What do you mean, Marcella? Wait hurts. Which one was one? The third bullet point. Uh, losses in previous, losses in previous records hurts your royalties. Losses in previous records hurts your royalties. 